Okay, uh, I'm back with another ORAM talk. Uh, this is something slightly different. So uh, this is another recent work with my advisor and our amazing collaborators from United States Naval Academy, Adam, Siango, Travis, and uh, Dan. So I'm going to talk about an efficient range ORAM construction. I'm tell you, I'll tell you what this means. Um, unfortunately, if you did attend my last talk, I have to repeat some background um, just to motivate the talk. So yeah, feel free to ignore. Anyway, <laughs> um, OK, again, I don't have to convince you cloud. It's all about the clouds. We are storing a lot of data on the clouds, which includes confidential information. So uh, we need to protect this data. And protecting outsourced data has several challenges. Uh, you could always start with encryption, and this will probably solve your problem for uh, several scenarios. But if you're really, really care, uh, you really, really care about security, you want to store ultra-sensitive data on an untrusted cloud, then you probably might want to look for something stronger than encryption. Uh, this is because even with encrypted items, a cloud will still observe your access patterns. And it turns out that leaking access patterns can completely undermine the security of your um, encryption in several scenarios. If you wanted to hide your access patterns, you could use an oblivious RAM. And at the high level, uh, an oblivious RAM allows a client to access items from an untrusted physical store without leaking to the storage adversary which items are being accessed and what kind of operations are being performed on them. Dilbert wants to access a client from, uh, an item from the cloud. Instead of directly di uh, downloading the item, Dilbert uses a, uh, an oblivious RAM protocol. And now what the cloud observes is a bunch of random accesses which are not correlated to the item ID. Uh, I'll again describe PathORAM to motivate the problem here. So uh, PathORAM is... Um, was first presented at CCS 2013. It's really optimal. Um, PathORAM divides the storage into two parts. The client-side storage is on your left, and your uh, server-side storage is on the right. And it includes a binary tree. Each node of the binary tree can hold a constant number of blocks. And logical blocks are placed along random paths in the binary tree. Uh, you maintain a lookup table on your client-side called the position map, but you can also store it on the server-side with more sophisticated techniques. When you want to download a block, you simply um, read all the contents from the path to which the block is mapped, uh, and then you will find it in your client-side stash. Once you have the block in your client-side stash, you need to ensure the next time you read this block, it's not from the same path, otherwise you will leak to the adversary that you're reading the same item. So what you do is you first remap this block to a new path, let's say v0, and then you write back the contents of your stash to the binary tree, now ensuring that this block is along the new path. And uh, as observed by subsequent work, you can also evict along predetermined paths instead of writing back to the path that you just read. OK, now things become a little different. So let's start talking about the performance metrics, right? So uh, like most of the ORAM work, path ORAM is optimized for bandwidth, which means the number of physical blocks that you will transfer in order to complete one logical request. Uh, also, in terms of round trips and computational complexity, at least server-side compute, PathORAM is uh, optimal. But we have been missing a critical component or a critical metric while optimizing ORAMs, and that is locality of access, which, this, which, means, which sim simply put means how many disk seeks you would be uh, incurring on the server side in order to complete one logical request. And of course, this is important because you would be storing all this large-scale data on the server on disks, which have variable latencies. And we all know that performing randomized I.O. is not really a good, good thing. You, you, you add a lot of overhead to your performance. Uh, to motivate this slightly further, um, on a hard disk, of course, random seeks are really bad. It's almost 10,000 times slower than the data transfer. Um, also on the SSD, this is not good, because if you have random placement of data, then you significantly increase wear. Uh, you have SSDs that last two to three times less if they have random placement than SSDs which have more locality optimized placements. Also, in most of your applications, uh, you do assume some amount of locality of access, and you optimize for those reasons. A prime example here is file systems that heavily rely on caches and prefetchers in order to optimize performance. And all of these optimizations have an implicit assumption of some amount of data locality in your underlying layer. Uh, there are also applications that become almost infeasible if you don't have locality of access, such as applications which perform range queries, like GIS applications. OK. So of course, we, need, we want to come up with ORAM protocols that have some data locality. And we need to answer some important questions before we can do that. The first question is, of course, 
can we have data locality for free uh, without giving up any security guarantees? And as you might have already guessed the answer, there are no free lunches in life. So um, yeah, this is not possible. And the reason is, um, if, you, if, you, if you have some data locality in your ORAM protocol, then you will be able to distinguish your uh, sequential access from your random accesses, and this is exactly what an ORAM prevents uh, by definition. So once we know this answer, we want to find out, is there something that we can afford to leak in order to come up with better constructions that are locality optimized? And a suggestion by previous work is you can afford to leak the sequential access size, which means you perform a query, you, you are OK leaking to the server how much sequential data you have read as part of the query, but not exactly what data you have read. Uh, turns out that if you're, if you're OK with this leakage, then you can uh, come up with even better constructions or locality optimized constructions like I'll discuss uh, in a while. But first, uh, you might ask me, why is this acceptable? Why do I think that this will work? And there are several uh, application settings we actually discuss in the paper. But for now, what I want you to think is if you were actually using a file system on any ORAM today, you would be probably leaking this information through the timing channel. And plugging in timing channel leaks is actually pretty hard to do, and it makes ORAMs almost prohibitive. So now we know what we want to leak. What can we do? One thing you can do is you can optimize your ORAMs for range queries. Uh, and an ORAM which is optimized for range queries is called a range ORAM, obviously. And uh, the first construction of a range ORAM was provided by Asher et al. The idea is when you do a range query of size r, uh, you make the number of seeks that you have to perform independent of the range size. Now, the construction by Asher et al are uh, able to do this, but this is at the cost of some additional bandwidth. So what do we do in our ORAM? Our ORAM is a new range ORAM construction, which is optimized for both seeks and bandwidth. So you have order log n times fewer seeks and order log n times lower bandwidth requirement compared to the construction by Asherov et al. So I'll discuss how this is done. So this is the overall setup of our ORAM. Uh, we have L order of log n independent ORAMs. For now, you can think that these are all path ORAMs, and I'll tell you how this is different. Uh, data is duplicated across all these ORAMs, and um, a particular ORAM, RL, is seek optimized for querying ranges of size 2 to the L. Now, what this means is when you want to read a range of size 2 to the L from RL, you would require O of log n seeks independent of the range size. And when you want to write back this range again to RL, you would require O of log n seeks independent of the range size. So we are making the number of seeks you require for a range query independent of the range size. So this is possible due to a bunch of insights. Uh, I'm going to give you a high level idea of how this works. So let's look at the writing back problem first. So when you want to write back a bunch of blocks, let's say R blocks, you have to perform R evictions to a path ORAM tree, and this would require O of R times log n disk seeks because you are writing back along random paths. Now an important observation we make here is that your eviction path selection can be deterministic. So you, can, you already know a priori what eviction paths you will be accessing next. And given this, you also know the order in which nodes will be accessed per level. And what this allows us to do is perform evictions level-wise. And I'll tell you why this is important. But first, let's look at how uh, the eviction paths are selected deterministically. So this is a tree with um, n leaves. Um, and the first eviction is to this first path. The next, next eviction is uh, always going to be this path uh, Vn by 2, um, which ensures that the two, the two consecutive paths have minimum overlaps. Now, if you continue this process, you will basically end up with a path selection order, something like this. It's cyclic. So once you evict to path Vn minus 1, you will again start from V0, and this process will repeat. Now, given that we have this path selection order, we want to come up with a way to store the tree on the disk such that we are, when we are performing multiple evictions together, we, can, we only incur the um, least number of seeks, or at least less number of seeks than you would do in a path ORAM. So I'll give you an uh, example of how this works. So let's say I want to perform two evictions, and I want to perform them in a batch. Um, again, we have the tree. And I have the nodes from these two paths uh, on my server side, uh, client side stash, and I've segregated them into levels. So uh, the way this would work is where you would perform the eviction level-wise. In the first level, you just have a single node. So you write this contents of the single node at a random offset on your disk. The second level will have two nodes corresponding to the two paths. And so you will write the node corresponding to path v0 at a random offset. And then you will follow up 
uh, follow this up with the node along the second path. And this process will continue up till the last level. And in the last level, you also have two nodes. So you will start with writing node v0 at a random offset. And you would write the next node uh, next to this uh, v0. So you would write vn by 2 next to v0. And what I, need, what I want you to observe here is that these nodes are far apart from each other on the disk, uh, uh, in the logical tree, but they are very close to each other on the disk. What does this give me? Well, when I want to now perform these evictions, I can perform it with only O of log n seeks because they require one seek per level. And because the path selection order is kind of deterministic, uh, the location of nodes on, uh, on the disk is deterministic. So the next time you read these paths, they will also require only O of log n seeks independent of the number of consecutive evictions that you're performing together. Okay? Right. So in the last slide, I talked about how we can uh, reduce the number of seeks for the evictions. Now let's talk about what happens when you want to read ranges. So the problem is when you're reading, uh, let's say, R blocks in a particular range from a path or tree, you would require O of R times log n seeks because they're along random paths. So, um, what we want to do is we want to come up with a mapping so that we can reduce the number of seeks uh, when we are reading the R ranges in a block. So an idea here is that we already, with our layout, we know that any R consecutive eviction paths can be read with O of log n seeks. So why not map blocks in ranges to these consecutive eviction paths? And the way this works is you have the path selection order with you. Let's say you want to write back a range uh, of size R, which is A to A plus R, plus R minus one. Um, the way you will map these two paths in the tree is that the first block in the range, A, would be mapped to a random leaf level, let's say Vj, and the rest of the blocks in the range would be by default mapped to paths with leaf labels that appear next to Vj in the path selection order. And when you generalize this, what you will find is that when you want to read this range next time from the disk, you would require O of log n disk seeks independent of the range size. Okay, so quickly, how does the access protocol work? Uh, let's say I want to access a range of size four. I'll read this range from uh, ORAM R2, and then because data is duplicated, I have to write this range back to all the ORAMs, and I could do, uh, I could batch these evictions together, and the number of seeks I would require is O of log n disk seeks for, the, for reading the range from R2, and O of log n disk seeks for batch evicting to a particular ORAM RI, and O of log square n seeks in total. Now, in the last slide, uh, I was overlooking a problem, and I will tell you what that is. So if you wanted to store your position map, map on the uh, server side, then when we update all these ORAMs, we would also have to update their position maps. One insight we can use here is we can actually reuse the paths in the ORAMs except R2. Uh, this is because we have not really read blocks from these paths, so they kind of remain uh, uh, unknown to the adversary. But even if we do that, we need to know where these blocks are, so we still need O of log n position map accesses, and unfortunately, this will blow up our bandwidth. So uh, what we do is we come up with a distributed position map construction, which allows you to find out location of a particular block in all the other ORAMs for free when you read uh, that block from a particular ORAM. So with this, uh, the asymptotic performance, what we are able to do is when you want to access a range of size R, you have O of log square n disk seeks in R ORAM, and O of R times log square n bandwidth, which is log n times fewer seeks, and log n times lower bandwidth compared to uh, previous range ORAM constructions. Um, so now let's look at how these asymptotics really translate on disk. Uh, so our baseline was path ORAM because to the best of our knowledge, R ORAM is the first implemented range ORAM construction, and we are anyway doing asymptotically better than the previous constructions. So we did our experiments on three platforms. We did the on a local hard disk, on an NBD and an SSD. I'm just showing results for the hard disk and the NBD. Uh, the first metric I want to talk about is query access time, which means how much time you require in order to complete uh, one query versus the range size. Uh, these graphs are in log scale, so it could be a little hard to read. But the take home message is on the local hard disk, uh, when you're using ROAM, you have a 30 to 50 times speed up for range uh, queries of a reasonable size. And on the NBD, you have a 10 times speed up, again, for a range of a reasonable size. And if you're not convinced, okay, this looks very weird. Uh, uh oh. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> so if um, if you're not convinced with the query access time numbers, I want to show you the throughput numbers, which does not look very nice. I apologize. Uh, but the take-home message again is we we 
We ran two applications, a file server application and a video server application for both PathORAM and uh, our ORAM. And we found out that on the local hard disk, the, uh, our ORAM features a speed up of five times for the file server and 11 times, 11 times for the range query intensive video server. And on the NBD, uh, our ORAM had a 2x speed up for the file server and a four times speed up for the video server. Uh, to summarize, our ORAM is a practical range ORAM construction. It requires O of log n times fewer seeks and O of log n times lower bandwidth compared to uh, uh, previous range ORAM constructions. One point I'm not emphasizing enough is uh, our ORAM is uh, a deamortized construction while previous constructions are amortized. Uh, we have optimized our ORAM for real world applications which include file systems. And in the paper, uh, we discuss several other application specific optimizations which will allow you to read uh, seeks even further. Uh, okay, finally I left this in the, <laughs> in the deck for those of you that did not, did, did not attend my last talk. I am on the job market. I guess you already know. <laughs> I am building uh, provably secure systems. The story does not end with ORAMs. I'm doing uh, plausible deniability against um, strong and coercive nation state adversaries. I protect data on untrusted clouds. I do secure CPU architectures and secure virtualization for privacy preserving computation. And yeah, I'm interested in other privacy problems like history independence and query authentication of databases. So yeah, with that I'll conclude. Um, I thank you for your time again, and yeah, I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, nice talks. <laughs> thank you. So um, Chris from UIUC again. So I'm curious, the standard trick for improving locality in trio RAMs is to organize the tree as a hierarchy of subtrees. So that as soon as you enter a subtree, you can traverse that entire subtree with only one seek, as opposed to for every level that you traverse in the overall ORAM tree, hitting a different seek for each one of them because you're laying out the tree as kind of a flat array. And so I'm curious, have you thought about that and whether or not that meshes with your guys' approach of laying out and doing the evictions level by level? Uh, so, so so if I understand what you're saying is that uh, you would be laying out subtrees with uh, locality? Yes, so instead of organizing the binary tree in memory as a flat array, as you'd right. kind of think of a binary tree right. in the right. usual sense, you would instead tile your tree by subtree. And so that what this would allow you to do is say your subtree is k levels of the overall tree, right. the free lunch that you have is you know that as soon as you enter the root of that subtree, that no matter what path you take through the subtree, all of the data in that subtree can be confined to a single seek. So with a single seek, you can bring in k levels of the tree as opposed to one level of the tree. Yeah, but that's still a constant uh, time improvement, right? Because this k is now going to be a constant, right? So uh, this is, we, are, we, are, we don't have a constant time improvement. This is a linear improvement in the number of seeks. Right, I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. So I'm curious, because it can be a very big constant. It can be a factor of between seven and 10 less right. seeks. Um, so in practice, it would be comparable to the asymptotics, but my question was more, yes, it is a constant factor, but can you blend it with what you guys are doing to get an additional seven to 10 X decrease in seeks? Yeah, maybe, I mean, I can look at that. I've honestly not looked at this, so I can look at that. Maybe okay. That, maybe, maybe we'll get some interesting results. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? So, uh, not a question, but indeed now you ask twice, so indeed, with such a nice presentation, indeed, we let's say that you uh, your effort to get be on job market and try to find job works out. Okay, and let's thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>